Hello, everybody. Um, in this video lecture, we will cover chapter three, um, cellular level of organization. The slideshow. Okay, so we're going to start with cell theory um, that states that cell is the smallest structural and functional uh, living unit. Also, cell uh, theory tell us that um, your function as an organism, like organismal function, depends on individual and collective cell functions. So everything that happens in our body really happens on a cellular level. So if your muscles don't work, it's not, you know, just muscles, that's some problem in the muscle cells or uh, neurons. If, um, you know, if your thyroid gland is not functioning right, or let me say somebody's thyroid gland is not functioning right, that's a problem with thyroid cells. Or again, maybe neuronal cells. So the function of organism depends on cell functions. Biochemical activities of cells are dictated by their specific subcellular um, structures. And that means that um, cells, they have organelles and each organelle perform its specific function. So all this bi biochemical activities happens because of different organelles or different uh, proteins, different other molecules within cells. And life has cellular basis. And that means that all pre-existing cells come from other cells, right? So cells come from other cells. So that's what uh, cell theory is about. Now on this slide, you can see uh, this oval structure I represent a cell. And this line is cell membrane. Right, so actually nutrients need to move through the cell membrane, right, inside the cell. Then we have some biochemical processes, anabolism or catabolism that happens within the cell. And um, during chemical reactions, we can have waste products or we will have waste products and they need to be moved out of the cell, right? Um, and that's important for us to understand how cell membrane works, how cell membrane allow some um, molecules move in, right? And how cell membrane allows other, you know, um, molecules move out, right? That's what we will focus on uh, in this chapter, mostly on cell membrane. But if you look over here, this slide also explain you how your function as a whole organism depends on the function of your individual cells. Because when glucose and oxygen enter the cells, you have cellular respiration. This is how your cells make ATP, right? And waste product like carbon dioxide is moved out of a cell. Now you have your whole respiratory system to supply your cells with oxygen. You have your digestive systems to supply your cells with glucose, right? So you have your body systems to satisfy needs of your cells, right? Uh, amino acid, when you eat steak, right? That's a protein. Uh, you digest it, you break it down into amino acid, amino acid into your cells and use for protein synthesis. And your cells also uh, break down proteins and waste product would be ammonia and urea. And that's why you have your excretory system or urinary system to remove this waste product Nucleotides, uh, your cells use it to synthesize DNA, RNA, and you can break DNA, RNA, and uric acid will be a waste product. Also vitamins, minerals enter the cells and mostly uh, acts as coenzymes to allow your cells to perform all these functions and uh, catalyze chemical reactions. And of course, water moves in and out, right? So our needs as organisms actually reflect the needs of our cells. Uh, over 200 different types of human cells and they all different size, shape, 
subcellular components, and because of these, they differ in functions, or because of their functions, they differ in size and shape, right? Because remember, uh, complementarity of structure and function tell us that uh, uh, structure and function are interconnected. So here you can see different example of human cells. Uh, one of the smallest one are sperm and erythrocytes, and you have large, such as skeletal muscle cells or nerve cells. Even nerve cells, the cell body might not look that big, but this axon and all those branches, those are part of a cell. Uh, fat cells, macrophages, right, fibroblast, that's uh, epithelial cells. So that's, uh, you know, lots of diversity in cells, structure and shape and function. But doesn't matter what cell we are looking at, general cell, and here we're talking about human cells, and humans are a eukaryotic organism, so it doesn't, it's not relative to eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells because it has nucleus, right? So we're talking specifically about human cells. They all have plasma membrane, flexible outer boundary, cytoplasm, that includes cytosol and organelles. So cytoplasm are made uh, from intracellular fluid and organelles. And nucleus, control center that contains DNA and uh, RNA. Um, so that's a diagram of a typical uh, eukaryotic cell with uh, all these different organelles. In, um, in this course, because it's physiology course, we are not covering function of individual organelles. You studied it when you took your general bio class and you will uh, look at all these organelles when you take anatomy class, or if you already did, so you already should know function of these organelles. In this chapter, we will talk about cell membrane or plasma membrane. It's a biomolecular layer of lipids and proteins in a constantly changing fluid mosaic arrangement. It plays dynamic role in cellular activity. It separates ICF from ECF, and ICF is intracellular fluid inside a cell, and ECF extracellular fluid outside a cell. Another name for ECF is interstitial fluid or even tissue fluid. So different names for the same uh, uh, fluid compartment, right? So it's e ECF. Did I say ECF or ECL? If I said ECL, I'm sorry. ICF, ECF, because F stands for fluid. So here's a diagram of uh, plasma membrane. It's a uh, phospholipid bilayer. So it has two uh, layers of phospholipids. So those molecules represent phospholipids. Now these blue molecules represent different proteins. We will talk about it in a minute. Now this yellow structure inside is cholesterol, that is lipid. And then we have those uh, sugar attached uh, to proteins making glycoproteins or to the lipids making glycolipid, right? So uh, those are um, oligosaccharides. So they, you know, a chain of sugar molecule no longer than uh, 100 simple sugar, right? So we have monosaccharides, remember disaccharide, oligosaccharides have less than 100 sugar molecules. And then we have polysaccharides that have, that have more than 100, right? Okay, so if you're looking at membrane lipids, uh, mostly are phospholipids, 75%, and they make a phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid has uh, two parts, uh, polar uh, hydrophilic head and fatty acid tail that is nonpolar, and hydrophobic. And we talk about it in our previous chapter. About 5% are glycolipids. Uh, those are lipids with polar sugar groups on the outer membrane surface. So if I go back, um, so this green um, you know, sugar attached to the lipids, that's our glycolipids. 
it's over here, open over here. And uh, about 20% cholesterol um, that increases membrane stability and fluidity. So those are lipids of membrane. And we have uh, membrane proteins. We have two types of proteins, integral proteins and peripheral proteins. Now, integral proteins, they are firmly inserted into the membrane. Most of integral proteins are transmembrane. That means that they pinch membrane from out to in. So they go through the whole, um, uh, through the whole membrane, right? Transmembrane from um, uh, ECF to ICF. Now, function of integral proteins are transport. They can be channel proteins, carrier proteins, they can be enzymes, or they can be receptors. And peripheral proteins, they are loosely attached to integral proteins and include filaments of intracellular surface and glycoproteins on extracellular surface. And they function also as enzymes, as motor proteins, cell-to-cell -cell links, provide support on um, intracellular surface and form part of glycocalyx. So let me uh, kind of go back and um, so if you if you go back to this diagram, so this protein, right, this is um, integral protein and it's transmembrane protein. Right? So that's that's integral protein and it can be a channel protein or it can be enzyme. Um, now, those are peripheral uh, proteins, right? And those can, you know, very often they can change their location. They can kind of move within this membrane. Uh, and this blue, uh, like a helix-like structure, this is also transmembrane and um, integral protein. That's a protein. Now, uh, when we have sugar attached to protein, we have glycoproteins. And um, this glycoproteins, oh, I'm sorry, they part of glycocalyx. And what is glycocalyx are this sugar um, that stick out on the outer surface of memory. So let's, okay. So uh, function of membrane protein include transport. They can be receptors uh, for signal transduction uh, attachment to cytoskeleton that is inside a cell and extracellular matrix that is outside a cell. They can be enzymes, so enzymatic activity, intracellular joining, so they can uh, join two adjacent cells together, especially, let's say, in epithelial tissue, because epithelial tissue, one of the characteristics of epithelial tissue cells are close together and they form this impermeable barrier, right? And also function is recognition, cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So either your immune system can recognize your own cell, uh, for example, right? That would be cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So here's the transport protein. So this protein spans yeah, here's the name, a word I was looking uh, for, spans. So the protein spans the membrane, right? And uh, it allow um, some molecules to move in and out of a cell. Because this phospholipid barrier, it doesn't allow uh, large or polar charged molecules to move through. Uh, so water-soluble hydrophilic molecules, they cannot move through uh, phospholipid uh, bilayer. So they use those channel proteins uh, for um, transportation. Uh, some channel proteins like this one, it just always open. It doesn't require any ATP energy to you know, let those molecules in or out. Um, some proteins are used for active transport and that means they require ATP energy in order to move molecules. And when we have proteins that uses ATP to transport molecules, we very often call it a pump, I think like over here. So it's, we call it pump. 
Um, here's the uh, receptor protein. Um, those are membrane proteins that expose to uh, outside of the cell and it has a binding site. Um, right, and some molecules, like signal molecule, it can be hormone, it can be neurotransmitter, they can be attached to this um, receptor protein and it causes some change within the cell. Um, so here's the example uh, um, of the um, receptor protein. Now, this molecule shown here in um, orange color, um, any molecule that attaches to receptor protein is called ligand. Um, it can be neurotransmitter, for example, right, or hormone. So this ligand is called first messenger. Um, so let's say your nervous system or your endocrine system uh, sends signal to a cell and um, we want the cell to produce some kind of response. Right, so uh, neurotransmitter um, that is first messenger binds to its receptor. Now this receptor activates another protein, right? Uh, and this protein in this example is G protein. Now when G protein is activated, it's actually uh, start moving along a cell membrane and it's activate another protein. And this protein is enzyme, um, right? And this enzyme, as any enzymes, what they do, they catalyze chemical reaction. So it's convert another molecule, right, into what we call second messenger, right? So instead of ligand going way in, right? So this ligand is um, hydrophilic. So it cannot just move inside the cell so to pass the message, this first messenger caused the chain of reaction that leads to the activation of second messenger that already inside a cell. And then this second messenger can easily activate other enzyme like kinases, for example, and then we have some uh, response. Or it can activate some channel protein, so it can eat is the effect of DNA of a cell. So this second messenger might have a different function and we will have some response from a cell. Um, right, so here's another function of a membrane protein, attachment to the cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix. So this is extracellular matrix and below is cytoskeleton and you can see how this protein is attached to both. And of course, it uh, helped to maintain cell shape and fix the location of certain membrane protein. Uh, and some of uh, proteins like this, they just bind adjacent cells together. Um, so this function, those proteins function as enzymes. And so they built in the membrane and might, be, might have uh, active site Right, that allow uh, substrate to bind and chemical reaction to occur. And very often those enzyme proteins, they are, mm, there are several of them, right? And uh, uh, so they in a sequential steps because many biochemical reactions uh, require several steps between um, reactant and product. Um, intercellular joining, um, like this protein shown over here. This example is CAMP. CAMP is um, a molecule that provide a temporary binding sites. As it can um, be used for cell-to-cell -cell recognition or interaction. So one cell can use um, its proteins to recognize another cell, or they can form binding sites, is a temporary or permanent binding. Um, this is cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So over here, um, the good example would be your uh, white blood cells of, um, of your immune system that recognize uh, your own cells. So they recognize this glycocalyx, this sugar, um, that is uh, part of the glycocalyx. 
Uh, so by the way, what that's what glycocalyx is. Glycocalyx, um, if you look here, um, this is electron micro microscope um, uh, photograph or micro photograph. And this is the surface of the cell. So this is external uh, part. And you see like hell like structure over here. This is actually a sugar molecule like this. Sugar chain of glycolipids or glycoproteins. And this is this what forms glycocalyx. So it consists of sugar carbohydrates sticking out of cell surface. Some sugar are attached to lipids, glycolipids, some to proteins, glycoproteins. And every cell type has different patterns of this sugar coating. And functions as the fu function of this glycocalyx is as specific biological markers for cell-to-cell -cell recognition and allow your immune system to recognize cells versus non-cells. Um, and here's some homeostatic imbalance. Uh, glycocalyx of some cancer cells can change so rapidly that immune system cannot recognize the cell as being damaged, and then the immune system cannot destroy those cancer cells. Actually, in, um, as a part of our immune system, we have cells, like here shown, natural killer cells. They can destroy cancer cells. But to do it, they need to recognize them first, right? So here's, this is um, cancer cell, and you see all these receptors on the surface of cancer cells. And this, this is part of immune system, white blood cells, natural killer cell, and also has receptors. So some receptors need to be activated, some receptors uh, need to be deactivated, but when everything matches, natural killer cells can secrete chemicals that would destroy this cancer cell. But some cancer cells, they um, change their receptors. And you see like when this, it's shown here by adding this um, uh, red parts over here. And uh, when that happened, then receptors of natural killer cells that need to be activated are not activated because they cannot uh, connect, they do not match, and maybe some that need to be act need to be deactivated now activated. So this way, a natural killer cell is cannot uh, release um, chemicals that would you know destroy the cell. Okay, now. Uh, let's kind of very quick summary what we covered so far, right? We, we talk about cell theory. Um, we also mentioned that um, your needs as a whole organism reflect the needs of your own cells. Uh, we said that cells are very diverse. However, they do have three general parts, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and nucleus. And uh, then we briefly and talk about plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, and we uh, kind of describe what are major lipids. And then we spend a little bit more time on membrane proteins. And we said that they can be integral or peripheral. And then so many functions of those membrane proteins, right? So all these pictures, just, um, you know, you can read it again. Um, so that's all a uh, function of uh, membrane proteins. Okay, next. Um, very important part, by the way, about cell membrane potential. You, we will get back to it when we talk about muscles and nerves. So all cells establish electrical potential called the resting cell membrane potential that can be measured and it's about minus 50. Okay, uh, okay guys, I need you to turn off your microphones. I don't know why I can still hear you. So please um, make sure your micro microphones are off. Okay, so um, so every single cell establish what we call uh, 
resting membrane potential. Um, uh, and what it means, well, let's see what potential is. Electrical potential or voltage is a separation of opposite electrical charges, like what you have in your battery. What is your battery? In your battery, you have a positive side and negative side. So in your battery, you have separation of charges. And because charges are separated, you have energy stored inside your battery, right? And when electrical charges start moving, right, from negative to positive side or even from positive to negative, when we have movement of electrical charges, we have electrical current, right? So electrical potential is separation of charges. Electrical current is movement of electrical charges. Now, all your cells are actually little batteries because your cells separate charges. Your cells are positive outside and negative inside. Um, so ECF is uh, positive and ICF is negative, all right? So um, that's what it says here. Separation of oppositely charged particles in this specific case, ions, across a membrane creates a membrane potential or potential energy measured as voltage. So RMP or resting membrane potential is a voltage measured in a resting state in all cells. So every single cell in your body is a battery and it has potential energy of voltage and if we measure this voltage, it will be minus 50 to minus 100 millivolts in different cells. And negative charge will be inside and positive outside, right? Now, how your cells create this resting membrane potential? Well, the first, what your cells do, so here imagine that's a cell, and, if we, and we have ICF, ECF, uh, actually, the concentration of sodium is higher outside a cell compared with inside. So here's the concentration of sodium outside, 150 milli equivalent per liter, and inside it's only 50, right? So we have high concentration of sodium outside, and we have high concentration of potassium inside. Um, so um, we, well, it's a mnemonic to help you to remember your cells are salty bananas because salty, salty, lots of sodium and bananas, bananas have lots of potassium. So lots of sodium outside, lots of potassium inside. And uh, why? Why your cells have like um, this difference in the concentration of these ions? And that's because, I'll try to use my pen and see if I can do it. There is a special protein over here, right? So let me just kind of, and it will be schematic representation. So there is a protein. Wait, no, I don't need, I don't need this. <gasps> okay, oh. okay, so one, two, three. Okay, so here's the protein. And um, this protein, when ATP is attached, so ATP can attach here, ATP, um, it, take, it attaches three sodium from inside and two potassium from outside. And it's actually kind of like bring, kind of rotates. It's not that simple, but imagine that I have this protein, right? This sodium from inside and potassium from outside. And now I think it's kind of rotates. So now it's gonna look like this, one, two, three, one, two. So here's potassium, potassium, and sodium, sodium, and sodium, All right? So it's constantly releases potassium in and sodium out, right? So it pumps, it pumps, um, sodium out, potassium in. And this is called sodium potassium pump or ATP pump. And this protein would maintains the high potassium inside 
and low sodium inside. So low sodium, high potassium inside because it's constantly pumping out sodium out, potassium in, sodium out, potassium in. And it uses ATP to do it. So it's active transport. So that's why we call it sodium potassium pump. Right, so it's, um, um, so over here, you can see that because we have uh, lots of potassium inside, right? So here's, we have lots of potassium inside. Um, now, what we have also, we have those proteins, they called um, leakage proteins. Here's the name, leakage proteins or leakage channels. Um, and your pump constantly pumping stuff, um, sodium, pot potassium in, sodium out, right? So here's your sodium, here's your potassium. But potassium has this leakage protein and it starts leaking out, right? It starts leaking out and because potassium has positive charge, when we're losing positive charge, we became, our cells became more and more negative inside, right? That's why your cells have this separation of charges. You see this, cells are negative inside and positive outside. Why? Because first sodium potassium pump create high concentration of sodium outside, like so lots, lots of sodium outside. And lots, lots of potassium inside, right? Now, we, we do have a leakage uh, sodium channels, but very few of them. And now you have those proteins, like you see, you have lots, lots of potassium here. Right? If you have high concentration of ions and you allow them to move out, they will move out, right? So when potassium is moving out down its concentration gradient, right, you're losing these positive charges and that's why membrane became negative inside and more positive outside. And this difference can be measured and this will be about minus 50 to minus 100 millivolts. So here, for example, it's minus 90 millivolts, right? And this is called resting membrane potential. Oh, now everything that I told you, um, now you can read in next two slides, right? So let's just uh, make a um, very quick summary of what we just described. We just said that every single cell of your body is a little battery. What does it mean? It means there is separation of charges. Cells are negative inside and positive outside. So how your cells are managed to do it? Well, you have sodium potassium pump, right? That constantly pumping sodium out, right? And potassium in. So you create, or your cells create, chemical gradient for both sodium and potassium. Now, sodium wants to move inside the cell. It wants to move down its concentration gradient, but we don't have channels uh, for sodium to allow it. We have very, very few, right? And sodium cannot just move through cell membrane. It needs special channel proteins. But potassium can move out because we do have leakage potassium channels. So now potassium start leaking out right, your cell inside is losing positive charges, so it became uh, negative inside, positive outside. It's a little bit more difficult than uh, what I just explained you, right, but I think that's good to start understanding this, right, for now it's good enough. Right, okay. Next, uh, we already know that plasma membrane are selectively permeable. Um, that means that some molecules can easily pass through the membrane and others don't. So what molecules can pass? Uh, small non-polar molecules like water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, right? Ammonia too can do it. Now large molecules cannot pass through and even molecules are small, but if they have a charge, like sodium ion, potassium ion, calcium, right, they cannot move through the membrane either. So they require special proteins to do it. 
is the channel proteins or transfer proteins or pumps. Um, so two types of membrane transfer, passive and active. Passive does not use ATP and substances move from high concentration to low concentration, so they move down their concentration gradient. And active transport require ATP and substances move against the concentration gradient and it only occurs in the living cell membrane. So there is no active transport if cell is dead, but passive transport can happen in dead cells as well. Uh, so what determines whether or not substance can possibly per, uh, per permit a membrane, so pass through the membrane, is a lipid solubility. So if substance is lipid soluble, then it can pass through membrane. Also, if it's uh, not lipid soluble, if it's water soluble, but it has channels of appropriate size, then they, it can pass through channels or it can use carrier protein just like I said you. So passive transport uh, can be divided into simple diffusion, uh, facilitated diffusion, carrier medi mediated and channel mediated and osmosis. So simple diffusion for non-polar lipid soluble or hydrophobic molecules. And those substances diffuse directly through the phospholipid bilayer, like shown over here. That's a simple diffusion. Uh, facilitated diffusion is for glucose, amino acid, ions, and it can use carrier proteins or channel proteins. So it's still diffusion. That means we don't use ATP energy. We are moving substances from high concentration to low concentration. But in this situation, we need membrane proteins, either carrier or channel. Now, um, this facilitated diffusion is exhibit specificity. So channels are only for specific ions. For example, sodium channels, only for sodium. Potassium, only for potassium. Calcium channels, only for calcium. Also, they are saturable. That means that if we are using all the proteins at this moment, we cannot increase the rate of diffusion anymore, right? So rate of diffusion is determined by number of carrier or channel proteins. And it can be regulated in terms of activity and quantity. So here's a facilitated diffusion using carrier proteins. So those are transmembrane integral proteins and uh, some molecules, for example, sugar amino acid, they bind to a protein, protein changes its shape, and because of this uh, change, molecule can be moved in or out of a cell. Now, this is example of facilitated diffusion using channel protein. So the first was this carrier protein. Channel proteins, they do not change their shape. They just like um, little, you know, doors or that all, uh, these are always open. So they easily can be always open and always allow small lipid insoluble molecule to move down concent their concentration gradient. And then we call them leakage channels or they can be gated. It can be some another part over here or on the bottom side or on the both internal and external side of a protein and those gates can be closed or open. And then um, this will be a control of the molecules moving in and out. Right now, how these gates are open or closed, it, um, it, this will be controlled by chemical or electrical signals. Uh, this is passive uh, transport as well, osmosis. It's a movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. So water can diffuse just through the membrane. Even water is polar molecule, but it's really small enough to move through a lipid bilayer. Or water can also move through the special uh, protein channels that are called aquaporins. So here's aquaporin, and this is just uh, through the simple diffusion through the lipid bilayer. 
so water concentration is determined by solute concentration because solute particles displace, uh, displace water molecules and osmolarity is a measure of total concentration of solute particles. So when solution of different osmolarity are separated by a membrane, osmosis occurs until equilibri equilibrium is reached. So um, on this diagram, you can see we have um, two solutions that are divided by semi-permeable membrane. Right, and osmolarity of those solutions are different, right? So you see over here, uh, so this uh, dots represent um, solute, right? Maybe sugar. So let's imagine this is sugar. And so we have low concentration of sugar here and we have high concentration of sugar over here. Now, what would happen if we remove this membrane, the sugar will just diffuse it. Um, pretty equally. But because we have this membrane, sugar cannot pass through it. So sugar cannot move right down its concentration gradient, then uh, water will move. So water moves from high concentration of water to low concentration of water, or from low sugar concentration to high sugar concentration or solute. Now osmosis is extremely important in the living cells. So here's an example of your red blood cells. And your red blood cells are surrounded by plasma. Uh, plasma of your blood is mostly water, 90% water. And it's important that your plasma and your blood cells, they isotonic to each other. So when they isotonic, water moves in and out at the same rate. So we don't have net movement of water. If your blood cells are in hypertonic solution, hypertonic means your plasma is too concentrated, right? Lots of solute. Then water will move out of the cells and it causes lysis. Or if your blood cells are in hypotonic solution, uh, right, that's too much water outside, then water will move in. Oh, this is cool. cool. Uh, crenation, sorry, crenation, it's shrinking. Then it will be lysis over here, right? Water moves in and cell burst, that called lysis. So crenation, lysis, normal cell. Now, tonicity is the ability of solution to cause cell to shrink or swell. And um, there is different uh, definition for these solutions here. We we realize this definition to um, cells and um, extracellular fluids. So isotonic is solution with the same solute concentration as that of the cytosol of a cell, right? So your cells are surrounding by fluids. So when cytosol inside and um, tissue fluid isotonic, then we don't have change in a cell shape. Hypertonic is solution having greater solute concentration than that of a cytosol. And hypertonic is solution having lesser solute concentration than that of cytosol. Okay, so here's a summary of passive transport. We have simple diffusion, we have facilitated diffusion and osmosis. The energy source is kinetic energy, so not ATP, but for movement, we, we need some kind of energy, right? We cannot move if there is zero energy. Um, so, uh, but ATP is not used. That's why we call it passive process. And simple diffusion example, oxygen moving through phospholipid bilayer, facilitated diffusion movement of glucose into cells using carrier proteins, osmosis movement of water through phospholipid bilayer or aquaporins. Now, active transport, uh, we have active transport and um, like a specific type of active transport, vesicular transport. Both use ATP to move solutes across the living plasma membrane. Um, so active transport uh, require carrier proteins that we call pumps. A move solute against the concentration gradient and we have two types of active transport primary active transport and secondary active transport. 
So let's just look at the picture over here instead of just me um, reading you a slide. So here you can see cell membrane and this protein, right? Now this protein has ATP binding site. So immediately we should know it's active transport because we're using ATP energy. Um, this particular protein is sodium potassium pump. Now sodium binds, so where's sodium? Sodium is inside a cell. So sodium that is inside a cell binds to this protein. And this promotes phosphorylation of protein. So you see how a phosphate group is attached from ATP. So here we're using ATP energy. And when this happens, this protein changing its shape and releases sodium outside, right? Now, uh, from outside, we have potassium binding to the same protein, right? This cause actually release of phosphate group and protein back to its original shape and then potassium moved in, right? So potassium is released. So that's our sodium potassium pump. Sodium out, potassium in, and using ATP. And this is primary active transport. So now I have kind of like all of this picture individually, right? So I'm gonna skip this. But what is secondary active transport? Well, first we need to know that because it's active transport, it depends on ATP. But it doesn't depend on ATP directly. Actually, it depends on ion gradients that are created by primary active transport. So let's look at the diagram. So over here, we have protein and ATP is directly used, right? That's sodium potassium pump. So this is our primary active transport. Now, what happens over here? Because sodium constantly moving out and potassium in, we create high concentration of sodium outside. Now, because we have so much sodium outside, sodium, you know, sodium has this tendency to move down its concentration gradient. So sodium need to move from high to low concentration. And luckily we have a special protein to do it, right? So sodium now diffuses back through the special protein, right? But it takes glucose with it. So sodium moves down its concentration gradient, but glucose can move against its concentration gradient because it's moving together with sodium. So in this situation, we have secondary active transport of glucose that depends on a primary active transport. So glucose, if we don't have this pump, glucose would never move in, right? So it's active transport. It's not a diffusion. It's not carrier protein uh, uh, meditated diffusion. Glucose moves in only because we have this pump that create chemical gradient for sodium. And this protein is called sodium glucose symport. Uh, symport means sodium and glucose are moving in the same direction. Now go back for a second. And uh, secondary active transport is co-transport always transport more than one substances at a time. And we can have symport when two substances transported in same direction or antiport or antiport, the two substances transported in opposite directions, right? So when we talking about active transport, we have primary active transport, only pumps, right? For example, sodium potassium pump, or we can have secondary active transport when your cells are moving molecules uh, against their concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration, but they use energy of chemical gradient that was created by uh, primary transport. Hope it makes sense. Okay, now 
we have a couple slides that are the same. And another example of active transport are vesicular transport. And it's a transport of large particles, macromolecules, fluids across plasma membrane, and also requires ATP. And function is exocytosis, transport out of cell, endocytosis, transport into cells, transcytosis, transport into, across, and out, and substance trafficking. Substance trafficking is transport within a cell from one organelle to another organelle. Uh, substance trafficking, for example, uh, when cells synthesize proteins, they can move those proteins from Raffiar to Golgi apparatus, or from Golgi apparatus then to, uh, towards the cell membrane. That would be substance trafficking. And here's vesicular transport and, uh, well, because we have this uh, endocytosis inside a cell, so endocytosis can be divided into phagocytosis, when we have large particles moving, phenocytosis, uh, water-soluble particles move inside a cell in a vesicle, both in the vesicles, or receptor-mediated endocytosis, when uh, for substance to be moved inside, first it needs to be attached to its receptor, and then vesicle is formed, coated vesicles, and we're taking stuff in, right? So those are examples of endocytosis. We call it cell eating, cell drinking, and that's just receptor-mediated uh, endocytosis. Okay, uh, let's uh, very quick review. Let me see what time is it. We're doing good. So let's very quickly review what we covered so far. So uh, we talk about transport, right? And we said that we have passive and active transport. Passive transport use ATP, moving substances down concentration gradient, active transport. So passive doesn't use ATP. Active transport use ATP, moving substances against its concentration gradient. Then we look at several examples of passive transport that include simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, both carrier-mediated, channel-mediated, and osmosis. And um, then we look at osmosis a little bit more and we said, what is tonicity, right? Tonicity, when you compare concentration of solutions across a semi-permeable membrane, right? Is it isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic? And when we're talking about um, active transport, we have active transport and vesicular transport. Both require ATP. And active transport, we have two types primary transport and secondary active transport, and secondary active transport can be symport or antiport. Right, so that's kind of the summary. And um, last part of this chapter is cell cycle. Cell cycle defines changes from formation of the cell until it reproduces and includes interface and cell division or mitotic phase. Now let's look at the diagram. So cell cycle is very often represented by pi diagram. Now all this green arrow shows us interface and during interface cell is growing, it's performing all its function and it's preparing itself for division, but it does not divide. And then this uh, yellow arrow is mitotic phase or division, cell division, and mitotic phase are made of mitosis and cytokinesis. So mitosis is division of nucleus when cells uh, split the chromosomes uh, equally between two daughter cells and cytokinesis, we divide cytoplasm, right? Now this interface is composed of three subphases, G1, S, and G2. So G1 cell is growing, um, G2 cell is growing and final preparation for division. And an S uh, cell replicates its, its DNA. So it's DNA synthesis happened 
before division, before M phase, during interphase, in the S phase, right? So um, here the uh, diagram and micro uh, photograph of interphase. Now in interphase, uh, we have nucleus, nuclear envelope, and we don't see individual chromosomes, we have chromatin, right? Now, um, DNA replication uh, happens during interphase and results in two DNA molecules formed from the original process called semi-conservative replication. And then we get to cell division or M phase. Um, cell division is essential for body growth and tissue repair. Uh, does not occur in most mature cells of nervous tissue, skeletal or cardiac muscle. So not every single cell of your body divides. And mitosis um, made of four major stages, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and cytokinesis, division of cytoplasm by cleavage furrow. Now, we already looked at this diagram before, but here you can see major events that happen during all these phases. So that's interphase, and this is specifically G2 um, of interphase because um, this organelle, centrosomes, they already replicated, right? So cell is really ready to divide inside the nucleus. You don't see individual chromosomes. You see these structures that look like spaghetti. Uh, and um, that's called uh, chromatin. Now, when we move to prophase, that means cell is dividing, right? Specifically, we're gonna have division of nucleus and chromosomes first. So in prophase, mitotic spindle is formed. So this uh, proteins over here, this is called mitotic spindle. Um, now centrioles, so this is um, centrosome and inside those yellow structures are called centrioles. They migrate to cell poles. Now chromatin inside the nucleus condenses and became visible. So now we can see chromosomes. Um, now, this nuclear membrane dissolves, so you can see the pieces over here, so that's late prophase, and of course, cell decreases its metabolic activity. Now, next will be metaphase. Now, duplicated chromosomes, and they were duplicated during interphase, right? Uh, they form a line at the equator between two central poles. And we have the spindle that attached to the, um, this middle part. It's not always middle, but this called um, <coughs> a kineta core over here, the special proteins, kineta core in a centromere. So we have like centromere, 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 and this dark part is kineta core. So this spindle is attached to this kineta core, and that's metaphase. In anaphase, those proteins, they contract, they're getting shorter, and they start pulling chromosomes apart. So um, duplicated chromosomes separate, and daughter chromosomes are pulled towards poles by microtubules, this part of the spindle, this and that. And then we get to telophase. So telophase is the reverse of prophase. Um, so in a telophase, we would have a mitotic spindle disintegrate. So you can see it over here. So you see no mitotic spindle anymore. Now nuclear membrane reforms. So here are the pieces of nuclear membrane that will form a nuclear envelope. And chromosome uncoil again back to uh, chromatin. Right, and then we have cytokinesis. Cytokinesis begins during late anaphase. And a ring of actin microfilaments contract to form cleavage furrow, and two daughter cells are pinched apart, each containing nucleus identical to the original. So we have uh, proteins, contractile proteins over here that uh, form this structure here that's called cleavage furrow. And they contract and allow these two cells pinch apart. I think that's it. Ah, no, sorry. There is one more. Um, so by the way, I missed this one. So this is the cytokinesis. 
So this is contractile ring at a cleavage furrow, right? And it's getting uh, small and small and small and small in diameter, right? Allow finally this part of membrane to uh, fuse together, right? And cells pinch from each other. And you can see that nuclear envelopes start to reforming. I then chromosome will um, uncoil back to chromatin. And very, very quickly about control of cell division, your cells constantly receive go and stop signals. So go signals means yeah, go ahead and uh, divide or stop, stop division. So go signals include uh, critical volume of a cell. So when cell is formed, it's smaller and then it starts growing. So it's growing bigger, bigger, bigger until it reaches critical volume when the area of membrane is inadequate for gas exchange, or for any exchange, sorry. So when we have this creek volume, it's a goal signal. And plus some chemicals like growth factor, right? Hormones, cyclines, cycline dependent kinases. So all these chemicals that are signaling your cells to divide. Um, and your cells receive stop signals. And stop signals include contact inhibition. So when we have too many cells and they start touching each other or they start touching a different tissue, that should be a stop signal. And uh, growth inhibiting factors produced by repressor genes, so also some chemicals, right? So um, I think that was our last slide. So let's kind of recap. Uh, what we talk here in the last part of this chapter. Uh, we talk about cell cycle and how cell cycle is divided into interface and M phase. And interface is made of G1 or GAP1, S phase and G2. Uh, and this is where a cell is growing, replicates the DNA and preparing for division. And uh, M phase is made of mitosis and cytokinesis. For major stages of mitosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and then cytokinesis. Now, how your cells know when it's time to um, divide and when it's time to stop, because your cells constantly receive go and stop signals. And go signals can be critical volume or chemicals, specific chemicals, and stop signals can be contact inhibition, too many cells already, right? So they're contacting each other and they stop dividing, or also some growth inhibiting factors that are chemical factor. Okay, so that's it for this chapter three. I just wanna <laughs> remind you that we didn't cover function of individual organelles, uh, but we looked in more details on the cell membrane its structure, function, a little bit uh, about transport and cell division. Okay, so now let me see how I can stop, stop recording, pause recording.